I was born by the river in a little tent hole, and like that a river I've been a running, running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know that a change gonna come. Yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond, beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know that a change gonna come. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Wiley, and I'm running for president-elect of the National Bar Association. Uh, I'm glad you could join us this evening uh, for the Terry Wiley Party with a Purpose. And today, I have a special guest that I'd like to spend some time talking to a very important person in our country, uh, Dr. Robert M. Franklin, President Emeritus of Morehouse College. Um, I'm glad you could join us, Dr. Franklin. Uh, Dr. Franklin, you know, we're, we're in a very uh, precarious time uh, today. Uh, you know, we have a pandemic, uh, we have an election coming up, and we appear to be at a tipping point in, uh, as far as race relations go. And, um, you know, I thought it was important to spend a little time talking to someone with a history of uh, civil rights um, and and, and I thought you would be the perfect person to, uh, uh, to speak on these issues. Now, I, I see you've got a new book called Moral Leadership. Uh, tell us a little bit about your book and how you came to write uh, a book on moral leadership. Well, thank you very much for that question. And I am excited about your uh, candidacy for the presidency. And I think that uh, the organization would be well served by your leadership. What I would uh, say is that moral leadership is a critical ingredient for a healthy society. In fact, when a society, when an organization uh, has moral leadership at the top and throughout the organization, everything goes better. It goes better for the morale, for the vision, for the operational efficiency and for the community impact. And so I wrote this slender volume titled Moral Leadership uh, to talk about what moral leadership is. And in short, I define it as, as women and men of integrity, of courage, of imagination, who serve the common good and who invite others to join them. And as we talk today, uh, you know, at a time when we're remembering the life and sacrifice of Congressman John Robert Lewis, it seems quite appropriate to talk about uh, moral leadership and to remind ourselves that when we talk about moral leadership, that doesn't mean we're talking about perfect people. That wasn't uh, John Lewis, that wasn't Martin Luther King, uh, wasn't any of us. Uh, in fact, I opened the book with a wonderful quote by Oscar Wilde that says, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And so there's hope for all of us. But what it does mean is that all of us should be every morning stretching and striving and aspiring to be our best person, to serve the common good, to really think about what other people need, and then to invite others to join the effort to create a just and good society. Man, that, that, that's a great comment. Um, and so, so Dr. Franklin, in, in your leadership of Morehouse, uh, how, does that, how does moral leadership play out on almost a daily basis for you? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, it was, it was such a privilege uh, to lead the organization and to have thousands of young, primarily African-American men uh, gathered together for this uh, noble purpose of learning, of, of, of discipline, of service to the community, of, of creating bonds, lifetime bonds of fellowship with one another. 
And so it was a real privilege every morning to go to the office, uh, to walk across a campus where you'd see young brothers uh, studying physics and uh, uh, preparing for, uh, uh, for law school and med school and seminary and so on. It was just an uplifting, transforming experience. And one of the beautiful things, and I know it happens at a lot of institutions, uh, but part of the beauty of the culture uh, on that small campus of only 2,000 students is that we often would bring in uh, guest speakers, I mean, distinguished leaders like you from all professions to challenge these young men, to let them know that they can be whatever they want to be. And so that was a great experience for me as a student many, many years ago. I was a student of Morehouse and graduated way back in 1975 and then had the privilege of returning in 2007 as its 10th president. That's, that's awesome. So Dr. Franklin, can you teach people to be moral leaders? And mm -hmm. has that played a role in the education of these young men at Morehouse? Can you teach moral leadership? That's a fascinating question. I think there's a, a lot of debate about that. I would certainly maintain, as I do in this uh, in the book, Moral Leadership, uh, that uh, you can teach parts of moral leadership. So three elements that are so important are, number one, knowledge. Knowledge about the uh, calling, about what it means to be uh, a moral leader. And so you can teach uh, a lot there. Uh, it's uh, when we teach our children the difference between right and wrong, or good and bad. Uh, in a sense, we're teaching them to make certain value judgments and to prefer certain options over others. Uh, we want them to keep their promises. We want them to tell the truth. We want them to forgive folks who, uh, who, who mistreat them. Uh, so there are values like that that you can, in fact, teach. So that's knowledge. But the second element, according to Aristotle, so this is wisdom honed over a couple of thousand years now, uh, is, is the will or desire to do the right thing. So people can have it all up here, but if they don't have the desire in their heart, they'll, they'll never behave uh, properly. Uh, and so that's where the role of incentives often comes into play, where we try to encourage, where we celebrate. Uh, even when we give awards at our national professional meetings, in a way we're saying this person is worthy, is, 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 is deserving of our, um, of our honor and our respect and our reverence. And that's why we build monuments, but it's also why organizations give, provide endorsements and say right. this is a person of quality. And I right. know that you yourself have received such endorsements in your professional role. And then the final element, I'll just be brief and say, it's about practice. So knowledge, right. will, and practice. And when you're practicing telling the truth, practicing doing the right thing, practicing keeping right. your promises, over time, it becomes kind of a habit. Right. That's what people expect you to do because they associate that good behavior with you and your character and your brand name. And ultimately that leads to what Aristotle calls character. And it's, it's almost like people can predict how you're going to behave because they've seen you in action and they see how knowledge, will, and practice come together in your life. Right. Well, I, I can tell you that is a great explanation of moral leadership. Um, so doctor, I want to uh, ask you, uh, what moral leaders have personally influenced you? Mm. Yeah, great question. Well, certainly Martin Luther King Jr. He's the reason I attended uh, Morehouse. He had just been assassinated in 1968. So I missed him, missed crossing paths, but he influenced mm -hmm. me profoundly. There are three other people I write about in this book, Moral Leadership. And fortunately, the book just came out a couple of a few weeks ago. And so because right. of COVID, bookstores are closed, but you can find it on Amazon and online. I hope people right. will take a look. Tell me what you think about what I've, what I've tried to put out there. But uh, Ella Baker is a second figure that I highlight in this book. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that name, but she was a powerful grassroots organizer. 
Uh, she was older than Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement. And they say that she's the only woman who could challenge Dr. King, hold him accountable uh, and in such ways that he would sometimes change his mind uh, because wow. Ella Baker was that powerful uh, uh, womanist leader, female leader uh, in the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and also served at the end of, on the uh, board of the NAACP. So Ella okay. Baker, uh, uh, two others that I highlight in the book are actually California-based leaders from the Latinx community. So, of course, mm -hmm. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, who were powerful leaders in organizing what ultimately became the United, United Farm Workers. And uh, so I highlight those four uh, leaders. They've had an influence on me, but certainly there are many others. And I would just conclude by observing the very first story in the book is about my grandmother who mm -hmm. was my first and most influential moral leader because I watched her step between two street gangs on the south side of Chicago where I grew up and talk to those young brothers and appeal to them and talk them down away from, uh, from fighting. And I saw the power of what one person can do when they have moral authority, when right. they are courageous and when they step up uh, to the trouble uh, and get in good trouble, as John, Ro John Lewis would say. Right. Well, that, that, is, that is absolutely fantastic. Now, Dr. Franklin, I want to ask you, uh, I, I know you had a personal relationship uh, with Congressman, uh, uh, with the Congressman uh, John Lewis. John Lewis, yes. And he, he, tell us a little bit about that relationship. Well, uh, I followed John Lewis's career even before I met him because, of course, we all observed what occurred on March 7, 1965, mm -hmm. at the Edmund Pettus Bridge right. in Summer, Alabama. And so I knew about him, but uh, because I was fortunate to uh, move here and, and, and return after college here to, in Atlanta, I did have an opportunity to meet him uh, and get to know him over many, many years. Uh, I live in Congressman Lewis's district, the 5th Congressional District. And uh, I have worked on his campaigns in the past. I have uh, supported him. But especially as a college president, I've had an opportunity to confer with him. Every time I went to Washington to seek scholarship dollars for my students, and I had a lot of amazing, amazingly talented students from Alameda County, from the Oakland area, who yeah. came to Atlanta for Morehouse and Spelman yeah. and Clark and... Uh, the medical school at Morehouse. So it's just extraordinary uh, uh, how humble this man was, how courageous he was, yeah. how thoughtful. He would think about things you'd say, and sometimes it would be months later when I would see him, he would bring up the issue that we had discussed months earlier. And so you had the sense this is a very thoughtful, pensive person who reflected on you and who regarded you as important even though you'd only spend you know a few minutes with him right yeah i mean I, I, go on you know what what i've noticed is and and i, and I almost feel like i can't believe i don't have a picture with congressman lewis because <laughs> every, it seems like everybody on social media yes. has a picture with congressman lewis yes and uh and you can just see the look in everyone's eyes that take that took a picture with him. Right. They've always got a big smile and there was a comfort level there of everybody who had took a picture with him. Mm -hmm. And you can just see that he was a special person. Well, now, uh, that's so nice of you to point that out. Uh, and I mean, you know, attorney Wiley, you, you are also that kind of person who, who, who cares about people, cares about their issues and sees possibilities that are still unrealized. So yeah. I really just want to commend you too, because we need to talk. Yes, we, we remember, we love, we reverence those who have departed, but we also need to celebrate those leaders who are on the scene today, who are willing to make sacrifices, who are willing to help us become a better people. I, I appreciate that, Dr. Franklin. 
uh, you know, I, I in my day, day job, I'm a, I'm a prosecutor. And mm. so, you know, I, I come from a, 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 a unusual place to seek the presidency of the National Bar Association. Mm. But the the one thing that I carry with me every day is that it doesn't matter if I'm a prosecutor or what kind of lawyer I am. Uh, I'm on the right side of these issues that impact our community. And uh, so, you know, that's what rules the day for me is we're on the right side of history on these yeah. issues. And uh, and I believe that very strongly. Uh, now, well, I do want to make one more. Uh, I want to ask you one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, C.T. Vivian. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What was your relationship with C.T. Vivian? Yeah, yeah. Now, C.T. Vivian, again, I, I was here growing up among some of these civil rights pioneers and had, did have the privilege of getting to know the Reverend uh, uh, Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, quite well. So what we call him here in uh, at Georgia, Daddy King. Uh, and many uh, years of friendship with Mrs. Coretta Scott King, uh, Dr. King's widow. Um, yeah all four of their children, but Hosea Williams, uh, James Orange, Bernard Lafayette, Zernona Clayton, all these powerful leaders. But CT stood out for me on, in two respects. Number one, uh, Cordy Tyndale Vivian, CT Vivian, was mm -hmm. older than many of the young, uh, the leaders that we tend to associate with Dr. King. You right. know, Dr. King was born in 1929. Um, uh, he'd be in his early 90s, but uh, C.T. Vivian was born in 1924. So he was five years older than Dr. King himself. Yeah. Uh, the others came later. And so, for instance, um, uh, John Lewis was born in 1940. So he was okay. 15 years younger than C.T. Vivian. So I just yeah. make that observation that uh, CT was so special because although he was slightly older, it's like having that, you know, that senior in high school, that senior in college, yeah. that yeah. person, you know, the third year law and you 1L, you know, and you kind of right. look up to them. And yet he had such humility, he would, um, he would mentor younger people. And yeah. so I always saw CT Vivian as kind of the professor of the movement. Always right. elegant and well dressed and 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 soft spoken, except when you made him mad, and that's when the righteous indignation would kick in. And we saw right. that, of course, in 1965 when he confronted uh, Sheriff Jim Clark there in Alabama. Right. But uh, CT, uh, slightly older, maybe a little wiser, but a a a, a an insightful man of ideas mm -hmm. and of conviction and courage and the most beautiful graceful smile that one could ever imagine so wow. that's my memory of him and in fact on my facebook page robert franklin i posted a wonderful um uh, uh tribute to both ct vivian and congressman john lewis both of them departing this earth on yes. the very same day last Friday, July 17th. Yes. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, Dr. Franklin, um, you know, you, you know, the, you, you have the stories that we read about, you know, you, you know, the people that we read about. And mm -hmm. uh, so to write a book on moral leadership where you've seen uh, men and women actually live by it in in the face of tremendous opposition mm -hmm. and tremendous change uh it's, it's an absolute honor to uh have have you take this time uh and spend some time with me to talk to you uh it's, it's been a real pleasure it's been my pleasure i look forward to uh, congratulating you as the next uh, president of thank the you the bar association Keep up your good work, stand up for justice and righteousness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. And uh, this has been, this means a lot to me. And I know our listeners uh, can appreciate uh, what a special person you are to Morehouse and the difference you've made in many young men's lives. So ladies and gentlemen, 
you know, that, that was uh, an amazing experience for me to spend that time with Dr. Franklin. Um, and I will say this, uh, you know, I seek the presidency of the National Bar Association uh, for that purpose. I think that we are in a time where we need to have that moral leadership at the helm of our organization uh, because we are going to face some challenging times as we try to move uh, the United States forward and to make it a more fair and just place, uh, particularly for African-Americans. But as we make it more just for African-Americans, it becomes more just for everyone. So thank you for, for joining this portion of the Terry Wiley Party with a Purpose. This was the purpose portion of the party. I'm gonna turn it over to the DJ and let you guys have an enjoyable time uh, enjoying the music of our DJ. Thank you. <laughs>